Every day, you and I get bombarded with negative news. And just like our bodies becomes what we eat, our minds become the information that we consume. If you want to stay positive, it's so important that you also listen to stories that inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we interview world-leading experts dedicated to solving the world's most pressing problems. And if you stick around, I promise you will not only be as informed as if you watch the news, you will feel uplifted, inspired, and have more positive energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Hi and welcome. Today, Great.com talks with Rashmit Arora, who is an agricultural economist working for Mercy for Animals. But today we're not talking about Mercy for Animals because we're going to talk about a project that he's running for Mercy for Animals called the Transformation Project. And the Transformation Project is a project that is empowering farmers to be able to switch from raising animals to growing a better food system instead. And if you're new here to this podcast, you definitely want to press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because today we're talking about how we can make the world better, both for farmers, but also for our animals. Rashmit, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you for having me. So how would you explain the catchy name Transformation Project to someone that is not familiar with what you guys are doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Transformations uh, Project's goal is to enable farmers, as you said, uh, to transition from raising animals to raising plants in some form. Um, and we essentially exist uh, in order to bring um, you know, uh, an end to industrial scale factory farming of animals, which is not sustainable for the environment. And it's also extremely cruel to animals. Um, But beyond just those two pillars, which are often talked about, um, industrial animal agriculture can also be very exploitative towards farmers who are often ignored in the conversation. And so what this project does is it, Um, enables farmers to be a part of um, the transition that we see um, is imperative, you know, as our society moves towards a more plant-focused food system. And uh, so our goal is to ensure that the farmers aren't left behind as that transition takes place. I got excited when I read up on uh, the transformation project because we have had many animal welfare organizations uh, on this podcast and talked about all the problems that factory farming is causing but we haven't talked about what problems agriculture farming are causing for the farmers so could you please tell a bit about uh, yeah what does it mean for our current food system how does that negatively affect then uh, some of the farmers Yeah, I'd be happy to delve into that. So the way contract animal agriculture works uh, in the US is, um, I'll give you the example of how the chicken industry works. works. So the way contract chicken farming works is that um, these farmers, right, which are usually small farmers, right, single farmer, um, you know, operations, the what they do is they sign contracts with larger companies Um, you know, such as Pilgrim's Pride or Tyson. um, And they uh, sign a contract to commit to raising animals on behalf of the company. And the exploitation that I referred to earlier occurs in those contracts. So in order to raise those animals, first off, the farmer needs to take on a ton of debt in order to build these chicken houses that house the birds that they'll be growing. Um, And that amount of debt usually amounts to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, And it takes several years uh, for farmers to be able to pay that off. So the average 
small business administration loan to a chicken farmer in the US is about $695,000. And that's the average figure. It could be actually much higher than that. Um, so it takes you know years and years for farmers to pay off this debt. But usually what happens is that as the farmers get close to paying off that debt, chicken companies come back and say, oh, well, you need to make X, Y, and Z upgrades to the chicken houses if you want to keep your contract. And so they have to take on another you know, whatever, $150,000, $200,000 in debt, and it's just an endless loop. Um, what makes all of this worse is that um, these farmers are paid in a very uh, inequitable way. So chicken farmers, contract chicken farmers, are usually paid under what's known as a tournament system. So they re receive a certain amount of base pay uh, per pound of product that they produce, right? Um, but the rest of their income is usually determined by the tournament system. And the way that works is that it, it pits chicken farmers against each other in a local tournament. So say you'll have 20 farmers in a local area competing with each other. And the farmer that produces basically the heaviest chicken for the least amount of feed, um, in other words, the most feed efficient chicken uh, wins the tournament. Uh, now, what this does is it creates huge inequalities in um, the payment uh, payments to farmers, right? Like you, your your feed efficiency could be only marginally off, but the amount of pay that you receive would be drastically different from what the top grower in the system uh, receives. And so, um, the average, like, so for a chicken farmer in the U.S., right, the median net income, which is that um, you know, it's the middle mark of income. Uh, is about like thirteen thousand dollars or something. You know, that's like how much money they're left with after paying all of their expenses and you know their debt payments at the end of a year. And that basically what that's saying is that fifty percent of farmers earn less than that amount. And so these farmers are essentially making nothing, and they're stuck in this debt treadmill. You know, which they never they, they don't know when they'll get out of it. Um, and the chicken con uh, companies have tremendous amount of control over these farmers because the chicken company supplies the chicks and the feed, right, in order to grow the chickens. And so they could actually, in some ways, control the quality of the chicken. Um, but, you know, if, if uh, so like the farmer, you know, if they receive a bad batch of chicks or a bad batch of feed, right? And they don't perform well in the tournament system, right? The loss is the farmers to bear. On top of that, if a chicken dies due to some illness or something along those lines, um, that loss is still the farmers to bear. So what, what these chicken companies have done is they've essentially offloaded all of the risk of producing chicken onto these farmers, right? And then they take the, they reap the benefits of processing the chicken and then selling the chicken, um, at a premium price. So that's just one example of how farmers are actually also vulnerable and exploited um, by this uh, system that has been set up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get nauseous just listening to this system. And um, I guess then as well that some of the farmers are not aware of these risks when they fully aware of these risks when they enter the contracts. And maybe they come in with a good intention of being at least kind to the animals, but they are left without options of being kind to the animals when their livelihoods are dependent on, can I maximize my feed efficiency in these tournaments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, when the, when the chicken farm, when these people decide to get into chicken farming, the companies paint a rosy picture of the situation. You know, they'll yeah. paint the picture of what being a top grower is like. <laughs> what they don't uh, consider, you know, is uh, all these other factors that I mentioned. And uh, yeah, I, I also don't think that the farmers are like, you know, uh, like uh, out there to be cruel to the animals. Like that's that's not their goal in a lot of ways you know a lot of these yeah. farmers do actually have affinity for animals um, and I've seen that firsthand in talking to farmers across the country you know is that they, they don't you know they want to take good care of their animals and um, it hurts them when they see them suffer but there's only so much they can do 
given the limited means that they have. I like that perspective in a way. It it gives some humanity back to the people involved in the industry. It's from from how I hear you speak, then it's more of the structure of the system and the top heavy players that are causing damage than all the people involved. Right, so you guys obviously help farmers to transform from producing animals into producing uh, plants. And how are you helping them make that transition? Because they have already put themselves in this really hard spot, right? With the contracts and the debt and everything. So how, mm-hmm. does that, how does that work? Yeah, so we basically exist to connect these farmers with anything and anyone that they need to be connected with in order to successfully transition. So that would mean that Let's, let's say that a farmer reaches out to us through our website or whatever. And, um, you know, the first step is we arrange a meeting. We get to know them a little bit, bit build some trust. And, um, you know, the, if they're interested in exploring options, we'll connect them to one of our crop experts. So there, um, there's a few, handful of um, crop experts that we're connected with that we work alongside. Uh, so we, right now, the two main crops that we're focusing on are hemp and then uh, mushrooms, which, you know, not necessarily a plant, but a fungi, uh, fungi uh, fungus. Uh, and uh, so those are the two main crops that we're focusing on right now. However, there are other options that we're considering as the project grows. So uh, the farmer will meet with this crop expert, learn exactly what goes into that form of farming, uh, learn how, you know, what, what a day in say a mushroom farmer's life looks like, what the week looks like, what's, what looks like, what the uh, annual cycle is, right? Things that they need to consider, what kind of equipment they might need in order to transition this, uh, you know, um, chicken house type space into growing something else. So that's one aspect of uh, the way we help them. The second is that, okay, now they have a transition plan in place. They might need funding to actually fund this transition because, you know, you might need new equipment. You might need some level of, um, you know, just like just things to uh, enable this transition. And so we, we, we don't actually directly fund the transition, but we do help them with finding uh, grants and with grant applications and loan applications and whatever they might actually need help with. Um, and then on the tail end of things, right, the third way in which we actually facilitate the tran- these transitions is by connecting them with potential buyers for their crops. So um, we don't want them to just, you know, start producing hemp and then have nowhere to sell it. The idea is to um, basically uh, help them connect, help connect them with buyers through different means. So um, one way, one, one tool that we've recently created to attract buyers is the transformation certification program, which was la- launched last week. Um, and basically it's a certification that, um, you know, can go on products using crops from our farms uh, given you know certain restrictions of the uh, certification, and then that that becomes an incentive for a buyer to get involved with the project because they can show association and you know charge a premium price for their product, and it also enables our farmers to get a premium price for their crop. Um, so those are just some of the ways in which we enable these transitions. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. So the farmer is in a situation where they have a problem they are in this they're locked in this situation and these contracts with the chicken farms and you support them with the information and the connections they need to make a transition profitable for them that makes a lot of sense to me now what is the effect then because so let's say you take one farm out of this chicken game um, mm. what what effect does that have on the system like does mm. the contractors just go and get the next farm or uh, yeah what is the net effect do you think of your actions yeah um so the impact i mean it, it would measure it, it would be based on what your measure or what your metric is right so i mean um if you're considered with say animals, right? The number of animals is your big area of concern. 
Um, the one farm that we've transitioned right now so far, uh, fully transitioned, is the Halley Farm. You can read their story on our website and stuff. And uh, they used to actually grow 192,000 chickens in one flock. Um, and that's over a million chickens that they were growing in a year. Now, if you assume that, that if that family had kept producing chickens for the next 20 years, right? It's, that's when the you know the farm retired, the farm owner retired. Um, well, then you know that's essentially like 20 million birds over the next 20 years that you've actually prevented from going to a potential slaughterhouse. Now it's not that simple, obviously, because the uh, you know the chicken house will probably off offload that and you know find another operation to take up that load. However, it's not all that simple either, you know, like getting farmers to sign on to these contracts, um, build and building these chicken houses, et cetera, is a time consuming and financially um, draining process. And so um, our hope is that, you know, that, that uh, restructuring isn't as immediate, but uh, you know, it, it does send a message and a shock to the system as is, right? Like that you had a farmer go out of your system, right? But and it's essentially the same, I would say, as if you um, think about like when you think about individual impact, right? Like it's like, oh, well, me consuming less meat or me consuming less dairy isn't really having a big impact. But the argument there is that incremental change matters. And the idea is that you're signaling to the market, right, that something is changing. And when we do that as consumers, we're signaling to the supply system that, hey, um, we as consumers are demanding something else now and the supply system will need to follow suit with that. And here the goal is that, well, if the chicken companies get the message that, hey, farmers are leaving us, right? And industrial animal agriculture is not something that's benefiting us, um, that they might change their practices and, you know, move towards something that's more ethical, sustainable, and um, yeah, uh, less exploitative overall that was a clear answer i appreciated that and um yeah i mean it's a it's a great place to start so how do you think the what does the opportunities looks like then for a farmer that is transitioning into um, other plant-based options and how do you think those opportunities will change i guess there is a growing interest for eating plant-based product or maybe that's just my bias no I, I i don't think that's a bias right by all means you are seeing uh, an increase in demand for plant-based inputs right so i mean when we look at the plant-based world, we often like, you know, get focused in on plant-based meat alternatives and plant-based dairy alternatives. But those are like only two sectors where demand is booming for certain crops. Uh, there's also all these other tangential things. So like household products, you know, uh, cleaning supplies, soaps, all these things that, you know, there is an, a demand for a more plant-focused formula in those industries. Uh, as well. And so you're seeing, uh, and that's important to keep in mind because farmers, you need to see where they sit in the entire uh, food supply chain, right? They're the producers of the raw material, of the raw crop that goes into these uh, products that we use at the end of the day. However, these products oftentimes don't use that raw crop in just it's absolute like initial form, right? It's processed in some way, right? Either powdered or, you know, it's treated in some way before it goes on to that company that'll use it. And so uh, for us, right, it's uh, like figuring out how these farmers, right, can fit into the plant-based ingredient supply chain um, that is taking shape now because there is an increase in demand for plant-based everything across the board. Um, so yeah, the, the, the immediate buyers of crops from these farmers would be those middlemen who actually work with farmers. So, you know, um, like ingredient manufacturers, like, you know, PRS or others that are um, growing, uh, that, are, that are supplying, you know, isolates and other things to companies that are producing plant-based products. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how I think it'll all fit into the 
the broader supply chain that picture got it and we're coming towards the end of the interview now but and imagine someone would like to see more farms out there turning from raising animals to raising plants what can someone do as an individual to help the transition process Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say one great thing you could do is always write to us, you know. So if you go to our website, we have a contact form where you can fill out the form as an ally, as a corporate representative or as a farmer. And if you fill out the form, explain your situation to us, someone on our team would be more than happy to chat with you and see how we could help this farmer in your region uh, transition, you know. Uh, the, the, like we, we're working with people around the world right now uh, who are trying to start similar ventures. And so we'd be more than happy to help you because uh, we aren't under any impression that we would be able to transition all the farmers in the world ourselves. So we're here to enable other people to take on the, uh, you know, that baton and uh, move along um, this dream that we have of a fully plant-based food system. Um, so yeah, reach out to us, um, or you can write to me at, uh, Rashmit A at the transformation project.org. Uh, and I'd be happy to, um, help you out. Yeah, that's really cool. And you guys are showing that it is possible. I really enjoy the videos, uh, and the people on your website that had already gone through this transformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad. So, Rashmit, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with Greg today. It was um, interesting to, to hear how the system works from the inside. And I'll definitely leave here with uh, more uh, compassion for the farmers. And I can imagine that they want to live more in harmony with nature and with animals and that maybe you can help them. They absolutely do. And we're going to try our best to help them. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And for you listening, if you enjoyed this, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because that will show the algorithms that this is an important interview and it will reach out on the internet. So more people who love animals and maybe farmers can hear this conversation and be inspired to make a change. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.